it's a specter that's yeah. haunting this podcast until it, we finally it do is, it. It is the life aquatic of the show. Yeah. After we've gotten like, because well, life aquatic was a fairly magnanimous well, conversation. Oh well, like also movie. life aquatic was not haunting us. You just decided no. one day, hey, why don't we do an episode about the life aquatic? <laughs> I think Life Aquatic was fairly magnanimous for what it could have been. That is that is true. I, I tried to be respectful. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the Nolan episode is going to be the same thing. Um, but regardless, all right, here I just, we are. I just want to, um, Garrett, I don't know if you've seen the related videos for the our, uh, our episodes with porn titles, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, John I, Wish- I brought this to Tyler's attention. Um, he didn't know this. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to... I don't want to call it off because... I realized we missed a major opportunity in not calling the porn trilogy the porn identity, the porn supremacy, and the porn ultimatum. <laughs> well, there's also the porn supremacy. Are we going to have the porn legacy somewhere down the line? You know his name, Jason Porn. <laughs> Except you have to spell it just like born, but just instead of the B, just put a P. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe that would do it. Maybe that will help with the related videos. Um, um, the other thing I realized is that um, this the porn trilogy is not so much the Three Colors trilogy as the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, in that <laughs> we we did one, it was surprisingly successful, and then we decided, yeah, this could be a trilogy. <laughs> yes. Um, granted, I don't think well, I don't think anything we make should be in the same league as the Three Colors trilogy, but well, I I completely agree. No. But regardless, I, I, we are discount idiots. We'll keep it at that. Yes. All right. Welcome back to the Hack Fraud Show. I am Tyler. I am John. <laughs> and Good boy. Reed is constantly finding new ways to introduce himself. Uh, this week... <laughs> One day I'm just going to introduce myself by just screaming. <laughs> All right. No. This, this week, we examined... Uh, with, it's, this is... The first of a possibly two-part series, we, depending on how this week goes, we're not really yeah. sure. Um, but we watched a Scorsese film and a Hitchcock film, namely... And I'm realizing that might have been a mistake, but we <laughs> did it anyway! But we did it anyway. Well, here, would you have preferred to have, like, the double-fisted, like, Hitchcock movies, like a one-two punch? Or yeah. is it good that you had a Scorsese movie to uh, lighten the load somewhat? I don't know. I don't. If anything, it might have just made me realize, like, man, Scorsese. <laughs> just to see that sometimes, like, seeing two things put together just makes one of them all the worse. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit. But, we'll, but regardless, I, I'm I'm already damned with fine praise. We haven't even got into the movies. Well, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, After hours and the lady vanishes. Coming your way shortly. But first, what have we been watching? It's the day's old question. Have I been watching anything? It's the um, age-old question. Let me go to the internet and seek out the solution while you talk about stuff. Okay. Uh, I watched a few okay. things. Unless we okay. do, do you want to go first? Um, yes. I actually watched some things. Oh, boy. So, I had a trip yesterday. In my seat, of course. Um, <laughs> by watching... I believe it's the first two episodes of season 10 of Doctor Who with Peter Capaldi. You started with season 10? No, Reed, that's not the way to do it. (laughs) Fuck off. It's fine. (laughs) Fuck off. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, my God. It's fine. It's actually not fine, but it's fine if someone else who actually knows Doctor Who is in the room as well, so it's fine. Well, uh, what did you think? Um, holy shit. <laughs> okay, so, so, we start with episode one, which is called The Pilot. Yes. <laughs> which makes sense, because there's, like, a weird puddle, metaphysical, alien space oil thing that that basically hijacks this girl that the new companion of the Doctor, a female called Bill, and then it's a good way of you know, seeing Peter Capaldi back at being the doctor. Yes. And they just travel through time and, and there are some Daleks. <laughs> cool. <laughs> There's some Daleks. Yes. Well. Um and that and that episode I found I found pretty endearing, I think. Yeah. 
pretty humbling. And then the next episode. Oh, boy. <laughs> so this is what I assume is mainly most of the Doctor Who episodes where there is where it's organized like a short story where the Doctor and the companion yes. go through space time and they go through mi- mi- mysterious strange worlds. They they basically know little to nothing. They learn a lot really fast and then they try to solve a problem and they leave scot free for some reason. Yes. As well as these worlds being twisted in a very metaphysical and philosophical way that mainstream American television just just can't do. Yes, I agree. Yes. This particular episode was that the Doctor and Bill went to a distant planet several thousand years into the future to a nice city. Yes. It's a very nice city. And there are these robots there. And they maintain the city and they make it so good. Except they learn that people used to be there but sort of with how it, it, it works is that it's a society based on everyone being happy and when they're not happy robots from the walls come and kill them and shred them to bones and then they use the bones for fertilizer <laughs> i mean this i haven't i haven't watched this episode i did watch the pilot and was kind of like i i might be done with doctor who oh but Listen, I mean, the the Matt Smith era is, like, some of my favorite TV, but, like, that, that, that episode does sound like a fairly standard issue Doctor Who episode. They they take these kind of Twilight zone kind of setups and just kind of run with them. Like I said, it's like, it's the best of both worlds of an anthology series and a serialized yeah. show. Okay, okay, you, I, okay. Yeah. Okay, this might be up my alley if I can get past the camp. <laughs> you phrase like you ask me like why do I like original Star Trek but not Doctor Who and yes, I've just been like I've just been racking my brain sort of like figuring out like why that is um like first of all I think like the aesthetic of Star Trek is a bit better um I just I just like it's like blinding technicolor view of the, like primary color view of the world um and I think it's it's models are adorable um <laughs> I, I guess it also. I, I guess I just like the. Per, I like the performance. The performers better. Like it's all really surface level stuff. I'm finding. Like well, I, I think I just really need to dive into the show and just try and just make up my own damn mind. Well, maybe maybe you would enjoy classic Doctor Who, which which even I haven't watched to be clear. But uh, <laughs> that's that's what I thought. I was like, maybe I should watch like the classic episodes of the show. Maybe that'd be more up my alley because like the new yeah. sort of like postmodernism just doesn't just doesn't seem right to me. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> Like, I was a bit hesitant when I saw that episode because I'm like, holy f- fuck, what, I'm, what am I watching? <laughs> you say, well, that's good. I, I really love, like, tw- like, um, like world building, like, Twilight Zone-esque shows. Like, those yeah, are some of my favorite yeah. things. So this should be something that's right up my alley. I Yeah, I, it really should. Yeah. I mean, look, there, there are a lot of, like, kind of weird ticks to it that... I mean, I don't know. It, I don't think you should have to get past them because I think they are a feature rather than a bug. But yeah, well, of course, of course, I, that's something I know right right from the get go. You realize that the camp is just a thing. It's yeah. not. It's not a problem with it. Well, you know, I mean, look, like I said, I could like make you like a list of of episodes that that, that are good one that would be good ones to start with that have like really good premises. There are some like any season of Doctor Who, like even like great seasons are really a, a mixed bag there that like the, there's an episode. I cannot remember what season this is in. It was during David Tennant's run. There's something with like a devil or like a demon or something oh, that yeah. lives I was told about that. that lives in like a yeah. planet's core or something. That episode is garbage. It is so <laughs> awful. Um, <laughs> There's oh a, yeah, where they go fight the devil, and then he's that, on the. That's so. I think planet, it's a two-parter. Then, like, I think it's a it's two-parter. A two-parter. <sighs> and yeah, yeah, and it's a two-parter, and then it ends with like whoever shooting the devil to a black hole, saying "Go to hell." That's just, that episode is garbage. But 
uh, I, I'd say like, how about like just compile like a list of like the really like mind bendy Twilight yeah. Zone esque episodes, and then maybe that'd be something that's yeah. But but up my aisle. but then there's there's also like episodes that are just like totally transcendent and are some of the best television I, I've ever seen in my life. It, it, it is wildly like all over the spectrum in terms of, of quality sometimes. Mm. Uh, it really heavily depends on like who's writing the script and kind of the concept of, of the episode. Um, As tends to happen with these anthology series. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, Reed, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you jumped in and were not like totally <laughs> just completely. It, it didn't just like blow your off. brains out of the back of your fucking skull. And yeah. you're just oh, like, no, why? I mean, why? I, I mean, it kind of did. But. <laughs> I mean, like, some shows do that to me. Like, like anytime, like, Ma- anytime Matthew comes to campus and shows me an anime, I just, like, I just, like, left in my Western world going, ah! <laughs> well, my, my friend is trying to get me into um, Cowboy Bebop, which I haven't started yet, but I've heard very good things about. I've seen a couple episodes of Cowboy Bebop. It's, it's fun. Um, it's fun. That might be something for me to <laughs> dig into. That sounds a little like um, ass cancer. <laughs> just <laughs> that's not, just it's not ass cancer. It's 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 fun and it's got a good style. Um, let's maybe we should just do like like a month of Japan or something where like we. <laughs> oh, I am all the way down for that. <laughs> like we just we just like get ourselves like like different forms of like Japanese culture into us and like to see what we think. Uh, that was going to be the premise of my East versus West podcast, but like. I, but alas, I can transplant that to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Rhea, did you watch anything else or was uh, Doctor um, Who your only? That was about it. All right. I, I realized I watched something like like three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but I just never talk about it, talked about it on the podcast. Um, have any of you guys seen Son of Saul? No, I have not. I, did, I have not seen that. That's that's a story about like it's a man. There's a man in Auschwitz, and yes. it's I think he's one of the commandos. So it's like his job is like to, I mean he he's one of like the concentration camp prisoners. It's yeah. his job to like w- when people go into the gas chambers, it's his job like to go through the coats and get um and get like jewelry and so forth, and then like clear out the gas chambers once that's done with. And at one point, like. He finds a boy, and, like, it's his, like, his mission. He finds a boy, and, like, we don't know if it's his son or not, but he says it's his son. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's his, like, his mission to give him a proper burial. And, like, the movie is just all about, like, following him, trying to give this boy a burial. And he he, he goes through, like, all different parts of the camp, and we see this camp. And how it operates, we see all the people in it. It's 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 mostly like shot like from sort of like kind of a pseudo document documentary, where it's like we're kind of following him, and it's like this really restrictive. Um, oh god! Oh shit! What's the name? shit? It, it's just really oh, fuck. What's the name? What's the term for it? It's like very small frame. Four by three. Uh, no, I, m- maybe I'm not quite sure what it. I'm not, I, I'm not quite sure what the franchise is, but like oh, it's 16, all three, 16 16 millimeter, hmm? 16 millimeter. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm not, I can't quite remember. Like I said, it's been three fucking months. <laughs> I, I think it's in 16 millimeter. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just like being with this man and just sort of seeing the camp. Hmm. I I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of like I think it's kind of an incomplete view of like the Holocaust. Like maybe because like I just don't find like the whole like we're in the camp and with the prisoners view of the Holocaust all that interesting. I mean that's necessary, and I see why it exists. But like to me, I kind of I kind of see like the view from above uh, depiction of the Holocaust far more fascinating. Like, I think, I'd, I'd argue, like, the best Holocaust movie is Schindler's List. Mm. Because, like, that's, like, a very, like, from the from above, and you see, like, how this happened, rather than, like, the very, like, specific, like, this is what it's like inside. Well, I think that movie kind of gets to have it both ways in a very uh, interesting and effective way. Yeah, so you do get them going to Auschwitz and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, Son of Saul, okay, so this is a, that's a Hungarian film. It Yes, was, it, it was very acclaimed. It won uh, the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film a couple years back. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't seen it. I've heard like nothing but praise for it. Uh, it's interesting. It's, it is really interesting. Like, the filmmaking in it is actually kind of wonderful. Like I love it. It's like, sort of like really 
honed in. Like sometimes you're just behind this man for the entire time. Like it's all about faces and seeing all the dirt caked on them. And I kind of love that like sharp focus yeah. cinematography. Um, so like yeah, it's it's really interesting. But like I guess I, I can't insofar as like we've had like Holocaust cinema pretty much since the end of the Second World War, mm. and I I I can't quite say like what new things it brings to the table other than like just from like the very basics of like this is a story about a man trying to bring humanity into a place where that has all been stripped for where that has all been stripped from them yeah so like if from like that perspective it's really interesting and like i would never say like don't watch because like the filmmaking is honestly kind of wonderful and like this character of saul is kind of a fascinating enigma like you learn practically nothing like that's the great thing but like you you spend a lot of time with these characters but you learn very little about them mm-hmm. which i think one could interpret as like this sort of like as like you have where like these people have just been dehumanized so there is nothing about them they are just like these cogs in this machine, especially considering like they've been grafted into, they are prisoners who have been given these sort of slave positions of killing their fellow man and citizen. And like some of the imagery is also pretty shocking as you might ex- expect. So like, it's interesting, but I can't quite say it's like this, this, it's like a new depiction of the Holocaust. Yeah. Well, so, it, yeah. I don't know. I'll I'll probably see it. It's well, I might see it at some point. Uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see. It's interesting. Like, yeah. I, I'd be curious what to see your views on it. Are um, it does it does sound like it's a compelling movie. I know. I, I guess like I'm just like I'm kind of like over like the very like restrictive like very context le- context less view of the Holocaust. Hmm. Like I think I think right now what we need well, more than any sort of like the slow dive into it. Well, I think I think that movie came out in like I think twenty. 20- 15 i yeah, um, yeah. yeah uh the, if that movie were to come out now i think it would have a very different kind of angle on, on oh, things. Certainly, certainly. oh yeah i i can't i can't blame it for for not being the product of this time but right. Right, and honestly some like scholars of the holocaust actually gave it a, even scholars of the holocaust gave it fair praise so okay i i I'm, i i have no i have no real uh, beef swift and I'm, I'm just kind of like I just kind of think like we should be moving forward in a different direction of the Holocaust movie but regardless sure. that's a personal opinion go see Son of Saul it's great All right. Um, on a lighter note <laughs> <laughs> of course all I've been watching lately is Nazis <laughs> and the Holocaust and fascists and communist. that's all I've been watching uh, yeah well uh, alright so the international film saga uh, my class is finally complete Oh no! For our Aww. final for our final screening, um, let me tell you though, th- this class has really taught me to love foreign films. This uh, between this class and and the podcast and all the foreign films we've done lately, I've come to appreciate foreign cinema in a way that I never really thought I would before. Oh, of course. So you, you, everyone always thinks the language gap would be something would be something that impedes them, but after a while, you just kind of you roll yeah. with it. It's it's yeah. something you just gotta be, you gotta bathe in. Yeah. But for our final screening, we watched uh, The Host, a film by Bong Joon-ho, the director of Snowpiercer, which is a movie that we all really like, I think. No, we all, I, I love, I, I adore Snowpiercer. Um, I've never seen Snowpiercer. Ooh, you never seen Snowpiercer? Good movie. No. We, we might have to change it. We might, we might have to uh, do that, because I've been looking for an excuse to rewatch it. Maybe we could do like a Korean episode? Or? That could be, that could be good. Ooh, we could finally knock out Old Boy. Ooh, that'd be good. Oh, now there we go. Um, all right, <laughs> we've stumbled upon something here. Okay, so the host. Uh, I think it came out in two thousand six. Yeah, I think so. Maybe that might not be correct at all. But anyway, um, I think it's two thousand. I've heard of this movie. I think it's two thousand. All right, so it, it basically um, the concept of this movie is there is a monster uh, in a in a Korean lake. Uh, it kidnaps this guy's daughter, um, and much they of, do. and, uh, they, the, yeah. the monster is like, it kind of comes out that like the, the monster is carrying this disease and like anyone who touches it gets infected and he touched, he interacted with the monster. So he is kind of like trying to, they, the government like tries to place him in a quarantine and like they, uh, he and his family are trying to escape cause they're, they're trying to get his daughter back cause they, they figure out his daughter is still alive. It's just a very, it's a very, um, I don't know. My, my professor said that this is a better movie than Snowpiercer in her opinion. Uh, I think she's wrong, but, uh, 
The, the I don't, this kind of sounds like a zombie movie slashed with creature feature. It's not a zombie movie. It is a it is a creature feature. I think she t- my professor also talked about how like Bong Joon Ho was kind of influenced by Spielberg and like uh, Jurassic Park and kind of the American blockbuster filmmaking. And this feels like a version of that. It's it's very entertaining and it's got some good like set pieces and some interesting things going on. I don't think there's a whole lot to it going on under the surface but it is it is a very entertaining movie does it have some of like the jj abrams like i can i understand the surface of the style but none of like the depth of the style not in the same way because i think bong joon ho is a much better filmmaker than jj abrams but uh but well maybe a little It, it uh I mean, I haven't seen Cloverfield, but from what I know about Cloverfield, this feels vaguely similar. I don't know. I'm not going to denigrate this movie. I I don't think it's like an all time classic by any means, but it it is a very it is very entertaining. It's a lot of fun, and it's got some kind of interesting things about like government overreach a little bit. And anything in there. This movie does sound interesting. It, all the all any like kind of social commentary ideas in there are kind of half baked, but that doesn't like detract from the movie, really. Uh, in my opinion, yeah. also the the CGI is is pretty janky, not unlike Snowpiercer, but it it's fine. It, it that it's not that big of a deal. Sort of on like the Spielberg note, I think like a lot of people just really like, when they when they think like oh Spielberg, they just think like do it. In like a typical like '80s blockbuster style, they don't. I don't think. I don't think people quite understand like the the, the depth of the Spielberg operating style. Sure. Well, like that's that's a conversation for a whole nother um, yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I recommend the host. I think check it out if you're interested. Uh, it's it sounds interesting. I think I think Snowpiercer is better, but we will see. Uh, well, Snowpiercer is a masterpiece. So yeah. Let's see what else. Also, I caught another double feature. Uh, at the New Beverly this weekend. This time it was a Richard Linklater uh, double feature. Saw Dazed and Confused and School of Rock. Uh, Both of which I had seen before, both of which I had not seen in a little while. Uh, Dazed and Confused, uh, really good movie. I I don't, I'm not sure you would like it, John. (laughs) I, I, uh... I don't think I'm quite sold on the Richard Linklater operating well, style. You've, I've long like w- kind of wanted to and kind of been afraid of introducing you to Linklater. I know you've seen Boyhood, but Boyhood, yeah. uh, I don't know. I think you might. Well, how, well, how what is Boyhood anything like his like other typical work? Because like from, well, from what I've heard, like a lot of his stuff is far more dialogue. Y- y- yes and yes and no, because Boyhood deals with some like similar ideas that he has played with like throughout his career. But it's a it's a very different movie, and and like there's no there's no movie like that's really like Boyhood. It, it um okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've never done a coming of age story. Okay, before. all right, all right, all right. Uh, I don't know. No, his his other movies are different. The before movies are fascinating. I think you might really enjoy those. Dazed and confused I mean, in every. I mean, they have Europe in it. How how bad can they be? Yeah, dazed and confused and everybody wants some. I'm not sure you would like so much, but. Um, they're, they're a lot of fun and they have some interesting things going on. I, I should really get to like the before series at, at some point. Cause that, those, those do sound interesting. Yeah. But, uh, Dazed and Confused, lots of fun, great soundtrack. It's just incredible. Uh, it's got some really interesting filmmaking in it. I like it a lot. Um, actually before I go into School of Rock, let me say, I also watched, uh, George Lucas's American Graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Oh, it's it's good. It's good. It, it uh, okay. that was a movie that kind of got him uh, some attention before he became the Star Wars guy. Uh, yeah. It's another kind of coming of age, all all taking place in one night kind of movie. And man, I, it, it's not like it's not perfect. There's kind of some some lulls in it. There's some kind of shaky stuff, but. It's good, and like you can really see his potential. I think if he, if George Lucas had kept making movies like this, he would have been like really good at it. He uh, if he wasn't ruined by Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of a shame to see like what wormhole he got sucked down because this is a very. It's like it feels very like Robert Altman-y, and I say that like realizing that this movie was made two years before Nashville. Like, oh, interesting. 
like George Lucas could have been just one of the all time great like seventies kind of uh, like auteur, auteur filmmakers if he had not gotten sucked down the Star yeah, Wars wormhole. Yeah, is that pretend- like George Lucas is like a is just a fascinating figure even outside the like Star Wars wormhole. Yeah, that that man. I, I think I think like Darren French said like my enti- our my entire writing career will be like thinking about George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a fascinating figure, and American Graffiti is good. Uh, it's got some interesting kind of character stuff going on. Um, it makes an interesting companion piece to Dazed and Confused. They've got kind of similar structures. I will say, I think the characters in, in American Graffiti are a little bit better, but I, I prefer Dazed and Confused because I, I like its kind of aesthetic sensibility more. And I like the soundtrack more, which actually goes a long way. Um, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not hey, a big hey, at- Atmosphere goes a long way. I'm not a big fan of, of music uh, released before the 60s, unfortunately. Anyway, so then uh, there's School of Rock, which... I had not seen this movie all the way through in quite a while. Um, I remembered really liking it when I was a kid. And honestly, (laughs) this movie's even better than I remembered. It is a lot of fun. It is a very fun movie. It um, really, like, this movie is is about, you can tell this movie is made by someone who loves rock music and loves just, like, the, the idea of rock and roll. And, like... The jokes in it, like there are some jokes in it that definitely like went over my head as a kid uh, that are kind of yeah. kind of edgy, but this movie is very innocent in an interesting way. Like it, it, the you, you imagine like another person kind of getting their hands on it and being like, no, no, we got to make this edgier. We got to have the kids say fuck. We gotta, we gotta like yeah. spice this up. And this movie doesn't do that. Like it, it's one of the more mainstream movies that that Linklater's made. Um, yeah, like it's, it's like if, yeah. even if you have never heard of like Richard Linklater, it's chances are you've seen School of Rock. Yeah, yeah. He br- he didn't write it, so it's not like one of his kind of auteur uh, features. But he brings a lot of like subtle style to it. There's a lot of like stealth oneers in this movie. Um, <laughs> that like I I, I I always remembered one where like Jack Black is like performing this song, and it's just like a a long like pullback like of him just, just performing the song and kind of outlining the concept which uh is great and but there's a lot of like other kind of stealth uh one long sh- takes like that um well, jack black can be a great performer yeah also like yeah jack black is really good in this movie like i have i have always liked jack black i've always defended yeah. jack black based on this movie he and link later also did another movie called bernie which he is also very good in I think you actually might really like that movie, but sure. we'll put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack Black, he's just he's just great in this movie. Like he's, he's a great performer, man. Like, I think like he 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 can sometimes just end up in the in the worst shit just by yeah. like, being like a com- being a comedian in Hollywood. But like, give him some room. He could yeah. really light light the world. Yeah, Link. I think Link later has really kind of figured out his kind of untapped potential in, in a way that, that no one else has. And I, I wish he would do more stuff with Jack. I wish Jack Black would do more stuff with Linklater. He is his, he, he really figures out like how to channel his energy in an interesting and entertaining way in this movie. So well, that's school- probably like, if you're a comedian in Hollywood, you're going to end up and you're going to end up in mostly shit. That's just what happens. <laughs> it's sad, but true. Yeah. Um, so that's school of rock and that's everything that I've been watching. So let's get let's get to the main a, a diverse uh, body of work for Tyler's viewers. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> this week was interesting, but yes, and, I, and I can watch nothing but Nazis. Okay, um, <laughs> shall we get to the meat of the piece here? Yes, we can. What do we want to talk about first? Because I, I, we're going to have two very different conversations. I assume that is yes. Uh, why, why don't we let's start with After Hours? After Hours. Okay. 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 I fucking love this movie. Oh, so good. So this. this is a ride. The oh, movie, man. the movie is 1985's After Hours. The director is Martin Scorsese. Coming off you know of a, him. you love him. I love. Yes, we all love him. Uh, this may be this may be my favorite Martin Scorsese movie that I've seen. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. But then again, I haven't seen a lot of Martin Scorsese. Well, what what? Like I haven't seen Goodfellas. So uh, okay. <laughs> that's. that's why. Goodfellas is a masterpiece. Uh, yes. Taxi Driver, 
great. Uh, Raging Bull, I have some issues with, uh, but I, 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 I'll, I really defend. I'll defend Raging Bull, but I understand the criticisms of it. Yeah. Um, also, we, I love things like uh, I think The Departed's great. Ah, uh, yes, I agree. Casinos, Casinos, really interesting. If you want to pull that up, uh, still have not seen Casino. Uh, but it's interesting. I should, but. So this movie is kind of Scorsese coming off of an interesting period in his career. He'd kind of had his comeback with Raging Bull. He'd made, he'd, he'd almost made, I think, Last Temptation of Christ at this point, but it had gotten like shut down. I, I don't think it had come out yet. Yeah. Um, so he, he kind of like his first, a tourist uh, masterpiece he wanted to yeah. make. So he, he kind of poured uh, his frustrations into this movie, which not a lot of people seem to know, and no. can I just say, I don't understand that. This movie is like... It's a, fucking hilarious. This movie is a total hidden masterpiece. I'm sorry, like, one of the funniest things ever in a, Scor- in a Scorsese movie is, like, Paul Hackett putting up in, putting up papers that say dead person with an arrow <laughs> leading to the room of the person who's committed suicide and then just bailing. <laughs> This okay, so this movie, dark comedy, uh, follows um, oh, what's his name, Griffin Dunn as Paul Hackett, yes. a kind of workplace drone who uh, gets sucked into this crazy downtown Manhattan Soho world yes. after like eleven thirty at night and just after hours after hours. Yeah. It, it's like it's like one of these like the, the whole movie takes place in a single night. Yes, yeah. He is. He spends the whole movie just trying to get home and is sucked into one crazy misadventure after another. Increasingly, he gets he just gets dragged into an increasingly surreal like Lynchian kind of. Kafka esque nightmare. Exactly. Yeah. I, I realized yeah. this when, when we got to like there was like the Berlin Club <laughs> and you have like the man in the shirt refusing to let him into the club. I realized this is Scorsese doing Kafka. <laughs> this is kind of like a loose New Yorkian version of the trial. <laughs> You have a man who is accused of a crime who he, and he, that he did not commit. You have a mob threatening to kill him. Everyone he meets is some surrealist nightmare. And there's even a small version of the Guardian in there. <laughs> Where he even says, like, I will take your money to see. So it seems like you you have tried to get in. <laughs> except, he doesn't really, except he doesn't really end in some sort of explosion. It just... No. Well, that was the Wells version of the trial. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. All right. I know. I, I think that the ending is equally Kafka esque, where he's literally turned into a statue <laughs> and then given back to the workplace that he, that he <laughs> to dislike. Yeah. Yeah, what, I honestly like don't know how to talk about this movie because it's it's almost it's like it flows in an interesting way and it, everything yeah. just kind of builds on each other, uh, but it's it's really just, like, kind of a free-flowing, like, it moves from vignette to vignette. Uh, yeah, and sometimes, yeah. like, some of those vignettes are just about, like, him pinpointing just how crazy the situation is, yeah. and people just looking at him like they're a cocker spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that one scene where, like, he, he accidentally, like, picks up a prostitute, like, a, a male prostitute, and, like, goes back to his apartment, and, like, he... It's implied that like he he spends like an hour just explaining to this guy yes, what's happened yes. to him tonight, and it just cuts back to him just kind of bored, and and that that's like no nowhere near the craziest thing to happen in this movie. <laughs> oh yeah, I think like the craziest thing to happen is like is it like the, there is a no the craziest image in this movie is the mob driving an ice cream truck out because <laughs> they think he's robbing apartments i think that's the craziest image to come out of this movie i think the craziest image is that he goes it's at the very end and he goes to this lady he's he he's been trying to flirt with and then like she hides him by making him into a paper mache statue. He's then stolen as the paper mache by people who he thought was stealing another paper mache. <laughs> they actually bought that paper mache, and now they kind of see this as stealing something that was theirs. And and those people are played by Cheech and Chong. <laughs> like what? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this fucking movie. This movie's incredible. <laughs> um, and I I will just say like. There are like moments of Scorsese ness in it, 
But, like, overall, it doesn't really feel like a Scorsese movie. Like, this is him... That very first, that very first shot did. Other yeah. than, like, the, the filmmaking is very Scorsese, because he can... Yeah. Really, he has, like, a very a unique operating style. Yeah, well, and this is him, like, working with uh, the great uh, Michael Ballhouse, who would go on to shoot Goodfellas and, yeah. and, and died recently. Uh, R.I.P. But, uh... Yeah, he's, he's kind of got the same, like, kind of creative team going that he has on some of his more well-known movies, but it just, like, this is a mode that you do not usually see Scorsese in, and it's it's very yeah. interesting the way he, he does it. Yeah. yeah. Well, his movies are kind of, like, sometimes, like, these roaming, ep- can sometimes just accidentally be, like, these roaming epics, or at least more modern Scorsese, like, like this, like, like Goodfellas is only five years away for him, mm. and... And so, like, he'd be going into, but, but this is just like really tight and really self-contained. It is just, yeah. it is just this night. It is just this location. Sometimes we see these locations again and again, like as far as like this Kafka-esque nightmare, and they seem to get more nightmarish yeah. the, the longer we spend in them. And also, just like Griffin Dunn is marvelous. <laughs> He's so good. <laughs> he. I'd never even like heard of this guy, and and he 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 yeah. just gives a crazy, like every man just going insane performance. Yes, and, well, it's it's kind of hard to talk about this movie unless we just want to do like the comedian the the, the comedy thing where we just start quoting it from <laughs> beginning to end. There's just so many bizarre, I mean, most, yeah great touches. Uh, like he yeah. he walks into a bathroom and like sees a drawing on the wall of, like, a guy with his dick getting, like, eaten by a shark. By an alligator. Or by a shark. I, think, was it a shark? I, I think it's a shark. He just looks at it and then just walks away. Is this the same editor that Scorsese usually uses? Yes, yes. Thelma Shoemaker. Yeah, like, long time the editing editor. in this is fucking marvelous. <laughs> yeah, it's super tight. It's it's great. Read what, what, what were your thoughts? Um... Right when I saw the ending, I'm like, oh, wait, this is like Inside Lewin Davis, except the much earlier version, where every, where he basically starts and ends in the same place, but somehow he's slightly worse off. <laughs> if only... Yeah, it, maybe but, slightly like, better off. Like, Lewin, yeah. in, like Inside Lewin Davis, but everyone is literally out to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally an angry mob out to kill him. <laughs> I can't think of Scorsese ever doing that. It's just, it's so bizarre. It, it, it's definitely one of the most bizarre movies we've done for this show, but like, oh, yeah. it's so yeah. darkly comic and heavy emphasis on the dark. Like there are yeah. deaths in this movie and like there's the, the implication that he, he may have caused one of them. And Suicide is a running motif. And like, <laughs> you see, a, you, there's a great moment where you see he's like escaping from the mob. He looks in somebody's window, sees a woman like shooting a man. Like, it's very grisly. Like, you see blood, the bullet wounds. Yes, and yes. you think this is going to be like another thread. But no, he just goes, I'll probably get blamed for that. Runs <laughs> away. And the movie just keeps going. <laughs> yes. It is just another part of this batshit crazy world. The, it is such it is such a peculiar but here's the thing about it, like this isn't that different from like the Scorsese like taxi driver view of New York. Right. Right. He 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 finds he just finds a way to like shoot it in a in a different way that just makes yeah. it like the most kind of just surrealist like nightmarish kind of universe that you he, could he imagine. Turns, he turns Soho into Kafka. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's so, and that's really entertaining. I I don't think anyone knows how to shoot New York uh, as well as Scorsese does. He, oh, no. It's it's just yeah. incredible. Oh yeah, certainly. I, I think even like he, he, I think even like I, I think the problem with like the Woody Allen style is that like he he just he, he has he he loves that city a bit too much. Yeah. Like Scorsese is like he he clear it's clearly like his hometown, but he has a healthy amount of skepticism about it. Right. Especially with the uh, taxi. In the beginning, revving up. <laughs> taxi driver. That crazy taxi ride. <laughs> oh, it's incredible. I think that the taxi drives when you realize, oh, it's this kind of movie. <laughs> well, this, this movie... I'm in for a good time. Yeah. See, that scene is the crank to an old 
to like a 1910s car to rev it up. Except <laughs> that car is the automobile of batshit nuts. Oh, Crazy. incredible. This, this movie this movie really does not take very long to get going. Like you kind of no. you start with him in the office. I, I, he he goes and I thought it, I I thought it kind of did actually. Oh, interesting. Really? Well, it doesn't get like batshit insane until like that taxi drive, but like they're still kind of like, like you get like just when he first meets like the woman in in like the in the cafe, yeah, That's and the, you get, like I mean, the quirky. man dancing at the register. Yeah, I mean that's quirky, but it's like okay, it's not quite that. That was probably one of my big things with this movie is that this maybe this may have taken a little too long to like to like accelerate. Hmm. Well, I or like to like start. I completely disagree. I think it accelerates like really quickly. Like I, I think maybe it's just because you haven't seen as many Scorsese movies, but a lot of his movies kind of take their time with the setup. And this yeah. movie, this movie just dives right into it. It is, it is like really tight and self-contained, and that's weird for Scorsese. Yeah, because Scorsese is, especially now, he's in the he's in his mode of cinema of excess. Right. Silence is just uh, like just. I think it's just too much. Uh, the Wolf of Wall Street is like very deliberately too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some of his other movies, I mean, I don't know. It, 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 his, it, it's interesting because a lot of his movies are just designed to be exhausting and just to yes, yes. Yet they're also just really entertaining. Yeah, like there's, this, like there's this odd mix of like Scorsese, the like wild editing, and wild camera work entertainer, and like this sort of. Kubrickian house part of him that wants yeah. like to test his audience. Yeah, and yeah, like just to. to I, I don't think we, we need. I don't think we need to tell you that Scorsese is a fascinating filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just just to kind of wrap this up. Just to see him doing something this tightly constructed and this, yeah. and at the same time, just so off the wall bonkers uh, is is very interesting. And I'd argue this is one of his best, his most well put together pictures. I'd say so as well. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just totally perplexed as to why more people don't seem to know this movie. Is it just too weird? Maybe. I don't know. Well, it's not even been released on Blu-ray. I'm, I'm sure the Criterion Collection will get around to it at some point, but. Oh yeah. Well, I, one day, like the, the Criterion gets, gets on its kicks with certain filmmakers and, We'll get the Scorsese eventually. Well, they they have put out Last Temptation of Christ. I think that is the only Scorsese movie in the Criterion Collection at the moment, which is uh, kind of a crime. But yeah, that is a crime. Um, <laughs> Reed, do you have any closing thoughts on After Hours? Um, it's on my short list. <laughs> I, 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 th- I think it's on my short list. Good, good. So far for the Hack Fraud Show season two, this well, is no, my no, no, favorite. No, 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 no. A oh, volume two. Volume, volume two. two. I see. Yeah. We are literary. <laughs> yeah, this is so far my favorite thing we've watched in this new iteration of the show. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's Scors- it's Scorsese Kafka. What what more is there to love? <laughs> uh, great, but uh, shall we shall we downshift into uh, Alfred Hitchcock mode and talk about yeah. the 1938's The Lady Vanishes? And drown in our own collective ennui. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna vanish because didn't watch this. <laughs> oh, go fuck yourself! <laughs> what? what? We should all what? have to suffer, Reed. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually enjoyed this movie quite a bit. But uh, John, take it away. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm gonna. Here's my problem: is like when I'm bored, like the worst I can be with a movie is bored. Because, like, whenever I see, like, something, like, really bad, like, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, <laughs> then, like, I have a lot to talk about. But but with this, it's sort of, okay, well, the plot of it, it's, okay. what fucking country are they in? Okay, let me explain this. Okay, so, this movie has a lot of, uh, kind of parallels to, uh, another movie we watched for this podcast, Night Train to Munich. Yes. Uh, which was directed by Carol Reed, but written by the same screenwriters who wrote this movie. So, yes. It's funny, right? Like, basic, less than a minute into this movie, we run into our old friends, uh, Charters and Caldecott, the the yes. two English, the two English, wonderful. the two English gentlemen who are obsessed with cricket and cannot seem to avoid getting dragged into madcap adventures. I, I think one of the best images in this entire movie is them with the newspaper saying, 
Yeah, you see the Americans, they don't know how to do this. And they just, and they put down the paper, and it's the two of them in bed. <laughs> One of them is shirt is shirtless, <laughs> and then the maid comes in. That's... And there's some 1930s gay panic in it. <laughs> Which is very strange. It's so weird. But, uh, so this movie, um takes place in a fictitious European country called... Let me pull up the Wikipedia page here. Um, yeah, I never could get it. Um, they they mention its name, like, once. Uh, they, they say it's, like, one of the unexplored co- corners of Europe. Uh, it's called... <laughs> it's called Bondri- Bondrika. Bondrika, and everyone speaks German, French, Italian. German, like everyone... Italian, I don't know. Uh, so it's another it's another train movie um, starring Margaret Lockwood, uh, also of uh, Night Train in Munich. Yes, um, and uh, there's lots of wonderful model trains in this movie. Yes, so they're in this this fictitious European country. There, there's like a twenty minute sequence of them kind of being stuck in a hotel for the night. Uh, yeah. And then in the morning, they all board the train. Margaret Lockwood, uh, I think her name in this movie is Iris. She makes friends with an older woman named uh, Miss Froy, who eventually, uh, as the title would suggest, vanishes. And no yes. one no one can seem to explain what has happened. Uh, There's a doctor who comes up and says, like, oh, it was all the figment of your imagination. There never was this woman. Yes. Um, and this movie develops into kind of a... Oddly, like, pre, like, on the brink of World War II kind of conspiracy thriller. Yeah, there's, like, some international shenanigans going on right as Hitler was marching in Austria. Um, yeah. I liked this movie. Uh, I think it's, it's, I like Night Train to Munich more, because uh, mm. that movie's just more madcap, more fun, and has a yeah. bit more, a bit more style to it, I think. Well, of course. I, I don't think, like, I think we all prefer Carol Reed's filmmaker. Yeah. Hitchcock. I think that's just a Daryl Davis podcast. Yeah. I think, I think, well, I'm finding that I enjoy Hitchcock's earlier work more because mm-hmm. his, some of his later stuff is, like, pretending to be thematically profound in a way that it just isn't. Yeah. And I know, one thing I noticed in like this in particular is that like, there's a lot more focus on character than like the tentacles. Yeah. And I think Hitchcock just got too far into, Ooh, like, like in, in rear window, it's like, Ooh, look at the set we've built this wonderful, wonderful set. Yeah. And that's kind of it. That's all there really is to rear window outside of like some like that, the lower Mulvey uh, thin slicing yeah i don't to me i was actually really enjoying like when they're just in the hotel mm-hmm. and it's just a bunch of people bumbling about and i thought like oh this is gonna be some like this is gonna be like a screwball comedy but with kind of like a thriller twist yeah but then they get on the train <laughs> and like we lose our wonderful cricket obsessed british men for most of it until like pretty much the very end yes and like we get a fucking cad who um this annoying cad who's with this woman. Yes, uh, Michael they, Michael Redgrave, who is good, but he's he's no Rex Harrison in terms well, of the well, of the charm factor. Yeah, once again, once it goes into full caper mode, I just like oh, I've lost it. I think mm. that I, I kind of like most of like that dry British wit goes out the window. Mm. Like a lot, I just any any thematicness there was to it kind of goes out the window. Like some of the character, it, it it just turns into like the two least interesting characters. And yeah, I I just I just grew ever more bored with it. E- even when we get to like the batshit crazy like gunfight in the train, I just realized, <laughs> wait a minute, this is the most boring way to shoot a shootout. Uh, it kind of is, but <laughs> although, can I also say that guard or like that soldier who like. They knock out and then, like, regains yeah. consciousness and holds them hostage. What happened to him? That thread is just dropped <laughs> completely. Yeah. 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 Uh, granted, I do think, like, one of the funniest things in the movie is them just knocking him out. It's like, what'd you do that for? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there's, like, like this script is, is good. Mm. I, I, I will defend this script. That's the thing. Is like, like, cause I re- like, there's a lot of like dry British wit. Like I like most of these characters, particularly our wonderful cricket loving friends. <laughs> I, I'm just sort of mostly underwhelmed by it. It's, it's got good stuff in it. Um, yeah. I love any movie on a train. It's, it, 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 um, it's, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't know. I guess Hitchcock just doesn't know how to shoot, an 
action sequence at least at least in this point in his career. Yeah. Well, right, like there's some stuff like like I've seen some clips from like North by Northwest. There's some there's some pretty good action in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the Rear Window has some pretty tense stuff. Yeah. Um, well, this, I hate Vertigo, but um, well, that's, th- this it's is better shot. This is earlier in his career, uh, and you know he's still kind of figuring things out, which is fine. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I I did like this movie. I agree with you. I was a little bit underwhelmed. Um, I don't know. I I just I guess. Night Train to Munich is just the better version of this movie. Well, yeah, that's that's the problem is that like we are like there there's I mean it's it seems like we are being unfair to this movie by just constantly comparing it to Night Train to Munich, but same screenwriter, two of the same characters yes. are in it. Yes, and like it is just genuine and like a lot of the same elements. It is like genuinely difficult like to pull these two apart and well, like to see. Well, it's a very like, sim- is, it's a very similar setup. You, you know yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're like, international shenanigans, train movie, yeah, big shootout at the end. Carol Reed had just so much more of a style than mm. Alfred Hitchcock, who was very I, Hitchcock. Really isn't workmanlike, but like there's there's a very sort of like technic. He's very technically based. There's not. Yeah. I don't. I never like really view Hitchcock as much of an artist. Mm. In regards to that, at least in terms of like, I'm going to get artsy shots and like that's, I'm yeah. going to make, I, I have like a very defined style. Well, I'm, I'm willing to admit that we like, we have a weird thing with Hitchcock where we, we both like yeah. just don't seem to get it. Like we, we don't yeah. know what the big deal is with Hitchcock. Like I really like Psycho. I enjoyed the 39 steps quite a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I. You know, I, the, I I still haven't seen North by Northwest, but I, I feel like I might like that movie. I, and I didn't hate Rear Window. Like, I think that movie is perfectly no, fine. The issue yeah, I had I with so, so. the issue I had with that was that, like, people have, like, totally blown that movie out of proportion as to being, like, one of the all-time greats. And yeah. there's just not a lot going on in that movie. Well, the issue is, I think, like, people read that... And- what, I think that movie's just kind of horrifying, and like how, it, like, and I've even like read like some of like Hitchcock talking about the movie. And I'm like, oh, this is just creepy. Yeah, <laughs> you're just a creepy, creepy old man. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think part of the issue is that like Hitchcock is just not as interested in the in the thematic aspect of film. Yes, and say like these other filmmakers that we really love that like I, I don't I don't like comparing the two, but I'm gonna bring Wells into this because like. For like we 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 teach you about Wells because he made all these technical advances. Yeah, but you have to realize that re- Wells didn't envision or and like and other people like my uh, like like Greg Toland you know, people on it. They didn't envision these things because it was just something they wanted to do. It was because like they were it, it was always about like how can we tell this story? Yeah, through visuals and through cinema. What thematic resonance can we drip from current cinema? Yeah, that was where all the technical innovations come from in Kane. Whereas with Hitchcock, I get the feeling that he feels like he can do the same things, but with extra tricks. Mm. Like he can make an establishing shot that a bit better. He can make like coverage a bit better. He can do action a bit better. Well, it's about. Like, Hitchcock's greatest skill, I think, was, like, blocking and, like, shooting scenes in interesting ways. Like, there, yeah. there's that great, like, nerd writer essay on, on like, uh, how um, he stages that scene in Vertigo. Um, mm-hmm. And that's all really good stuff. But, yeah, as far as the characters in the story, you get the feeling... I mean, this is all straw man, because I don't know. But oh, he, 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 it feels like he just didn't invest anything in that it it feels like he just took the script and was like okay i can shoot this and i can stage this in interesting ways but i'm not gonna like do anything to it yeah totally i agree and this is all straw man because we're doing like some like pseudo auteur theory stuff here but like it it does really he he just doesn't seem to be that interested in like in the thematic resonance of cinema he seems far more fascinating in the technical aspects of cinema as cinema as a piece of entertainment and that's well how the critics of the time viewed him they just viewed him as an entertainer they didn't view really they didn't see any real thematics because they just he doesn't seem that interested in it he seems far more interested in cinema as a technical aspect and we aren't interested in cinema 
as a technical aspect, considering like how we talk about everything as if it were a visual essay. Well, part part of that is I think because we've just like I may be reiterating some points we made in the, in the Hitchcock episode, but yeah. We we may just be kind of blind to that because we've been living with whatever technical innovations he made for for decades now, and we you know we may not like recognize them for maybe how revolutionary they were. But I don't know. I just think I just think his best movie is like the last twenty minutes of Vertigo, where everything <laughs> kind of comes to a head. And you know I don't like that movie, but the last twenty minutes are a masterpiece. Yes. Yeah, so- I don't know, like, maybe just, even though the, the more I read into Hitchcock, I realize, I, I just kind of think to myself, like, is he, are these really innovations? <laughs> <laughs> like, the more I, I realize, like, these have kind of been things that have been around since silent cinema. I, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, I'd argue, like, there's, I, I'd argue, like, 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 the German expressionists are far more influential <laughs> and far more impressive than him. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's like there's some, I think what we just, I, I guess this is going to be a constant, like, to be continued, will we ever get it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we, we, we're not in the position where we're like, oh, fuck Hitchcock, we can't, we can't see anything in these. Like, we're, we're like, constantly lukewarm with him. We yeah. We never quite pinpoint why. Well, that's what's so frustrating about it, is that it, like, it constantly feels like we're teetering on the edge yes, with his, yeah. movie. like, I don't know, maybe it's best to just view his movies as entertainments, and as that, The Lady Vanishes is a pretty good one. So it's fine. It's I, fine. I, like I, it's it's got some nice dry British wit and some charming performers. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So that's that's that. Yeah, I, I do I do enjoy this better than like Vertigo or Rear Window or so forth. So, I I think we should just take one last stab at it. I think we should watch Foreign Foreign Correspondent next week and see what happens. Um, after Alongside King of Comedy. Yes. After that, I promise we will do another Carol Reed episode. Carol Reed. Yes. Yeah, I think because yeah, Carol Reed is such an expressionist. Yeah. And like he seems to be drawing he and like he is his influences are just so clearly European. Mm. Whereas like Hitchcock, I, I think I think it's I think it's fitting that this takes place in a fake country because it feels so non particular. <laughs> regardless, so next week is part two of the Hitchcock investigation. And the King of Comedy. Yes. <laughs> Foreign Correspondent and the King of Comedy. I, I think we're getting somewhere. I, I, th- I, think, I think so. We're, 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 working, we're getting towards a working thesis on Hitchcock. Yes. yes. One, one day one of us will write about this. Hopefully. But, oh, uh, okay. but we love Scorsese. <laughs> That's we, oh, cool. yeah, we all love Scorsese. We love... And, and I love Scorsese doing Kafka, so yes. And I, I've, I've heard, I hear the the King of Comedy is a fascinating movie, so I'm, I think we will find some interesting things to dig at with that. Oh well, of course. Like some, some even think think this is his best movie. So oh, interesting. So, yeah, like yeah, oh, King wow. of Comedy. King of Comedy is kind of like it, no one has ever heard of After Hours, but King of Comedy is kind of like an underground yeah. hit. Of yeah. So, regardless. This has been the Hack Fraud Show. <laughs> Indeed it has. Indeed. Um, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. Just go on with your normal lives, I guess. My parents left me for another man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gold. That yeah, is, I was... That's the best part of that, like, that shitty little, like, Saturday in the park with cameras thing we made. <laughs> You know, I was going back through my voice memos uh, to to rename all the files because they'd been like uh, all like, like piling up. And... They've been they'd been all mixed up uh, when I transferred to a new iPhone, and I, w- I was just going back through and, and reliving all the glory. <laughs> you, you... <laughs> John. what? What? We're in our shitty Goodfellas parody. <laughs> you haven't seen Goodfellas. This is the second time this has happened!